Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News. Watch I'm from Graham ahead today, remembering the shocking Hamas sneak attacks in Israel one year ago. We're going to look at how Israel has fought back against Hamas and its other enemies, including Hezbollah and Iran. And we're going to talk to CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell about the devastating impact of those Hamas attacks on the Israeli people, Israel's military response, and what could come next. Here at home, how churches and faith organizations are helping victims recover from the astounding devastation of Hurricane Helene. And college students say their lives are forever changed after thousands gather for prayer, repentance, and baptisms as they worship the Lord. All those stories and more ahead right now on CBN News Watch. This is CBN News Watch. Lots to get to on a busy Monday. Let's begin in Israel, where one year ago today, Hamas terrorists from Gaza launched brutal sneak attacks on Israeli communities, killing more than 1,100 people and taking 251 people hostage. It was the worst massacre of Jewish people since the Holocaust. Now, Israel is in a multi-front war, not only against Iran's proxy armies, but against Iran itself. And amidst the warfare, the nation is remembering the victims of October 7th. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has the story. At 6.29 Monday morning, the moment terrorists from Gaza breached the fence into Israel one year ago, President Isaac Herzog observed a moment of silence at the site of the Nova Music Festival, where hundreds gathered in memory of those killed and kidnapped. 7th of October, 2023, a day that should be remembered in infamy. This is a scar on humanity. This is a scar on the face of the earth. It's one of many observances happening throughout the country to remember the October 7th attacks, including an event by the government press office, the National Documentation Project, which is collecting stories of those who suffered that day. All of mankind, we have to remember what has happened on October 7th. We have to remember the atrocities. We have to rem remember the people who are still being held hostage in Gaza. On hand were family members of the murdered, as well as relatives of the hostages still held, and some who've been released. Each story is, is, is like, is unique, but together they create the full picture of captivity, a sad picture. Shai Zohar is the uncle of Omer Nutra, a dual Israeli-American citizen and tank commander who was kidnapped as he responded to the attacks. Omer was taken alive out of that burning tank that you've seen on the morning of October 7th. Ever since, we have not heard a thing about Omer. Zohar is leading a Jewish prayer effort in Tel Aviv, crying out for the return of the hostages. The world needs to make a unified stand against Hamas and saying they need to come back, period. It's been a year, and whatever it is that needs to be dealt with will be dealt with after the hostages release. This weekend, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, Israel is fighting a war on seven fronts against the enemies of civilization, including Iran, which launched more than 200 ballistic missiles at Israel last week. He criticized France's president and others who want to block the sale of weapons to Israel. President Macron and some other Western leaders are now calling for an arms embargo against Israel. Shame on them. Meanwhile, Hezbollah continues to fire rockets at Israel as the IDF carries out surgical strikes in Beirut. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. And our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joins us now, and he's actually with us right here in Virginia Beach. So good to have you, Chris. Most Americans may not understand just how deeply the events of October 7th traumatized the Israeli people. How would you explain uh, what it meant to Israelis? Well, I would explain it like a family. Uh, Israel really is like a family. Uh, almost everybody knew somebody that was murdered or kidnapped on October 7th or had a son or daughter that went into the reserves after uh, they decided to go into uh, the Gaza Strip to eliminate Hamas. Uh, you could compare it to this. I mean, equivalently, maybe about 30,000 people would have died if they had the same attack here in the United States. And uh, so Israel is so well knit together. Mm -hmm. um, they know each other. They, they connect with each other in a way that they don't necessarily do in Western countries. So the trauma is just really profound, what's going on 
and has been going on for the last year. Mm. Has it changed the public's view of the necessity of eliminating uh, their enemies, Hezbollah and others? Yeah, everybody knew that this could happen, but most people didn't think it would happen. Mm -hmm. So, and it was such a horrific way that it happened that I think they, there was such a sense we need to take care of Hamas. And then for almost a year, the sense has we have to go after Hezbollah. We can't allow a monster actually 10 times as big as Hamas to exist on our northern border. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they lived with this kind of threat for many, many decades. And yet, uh, they, once October 7th happened, the mentality changed mm -hmm. uh, among Israelis. Hamas is still firing rockets at southern Israel and Tel Aviv, but have they been essentially defeated? They have. They have been essentially defeated. They had 24 brigades. brigades. They believe 23 have been eliminated. Uh, most of the rockets have been uh, either captured or destroyed. The tunnel system, Ephraim, that was about 400 miles long, uh, longer th than the London Underground, mm -hmm. uh, you know, has been eliminated as well. And let me add one thing about the impact. There was a post, there was a front page on the post Jerusalem Post this morning, and it said, one year later, the words still fail mm -hmm. to capture what happened that day, and it was just an empty page. Mm -hmm. Wow. Hezbollah is also keeping up its attacks on northern Israel. Will Israel go after them until they're basically dismantled? I think so. I mean, I think the mentality really changed uh, in Israel and the IDF and the political leadership that they have to make sure that uh, Hezbollah won't pose a threat and it's really a sense of a change in, in really um, mentality that we're going to have, we need a victory. Mm -hmm. We don't need to just maintain the status quo like they have for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. but they have to actually defeat their enemy so they're no longer a threat. And especially on the north, they have to make sure that more than 60,000 Israelis can go back to their homes. They've been there, they've been evacuated since October 8th. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is criticizing other countries who are calling for arms embargoes on Israel. How effective will those embargoes be? Well, it remains to be seen, but I think two things have happened since, uh, since October 7th. One is that, the, that uh, Israel has a mentality that they're going to have to produce their own weapons. And, uh, and I think that has already began right after October 7th. They can't depend on the United States or other Western countries to provide those munitions. The other thing I think is they make the point, and they have been doing this for a year, is the government and others, this is not just Israel's battle. This is a battle of Western civilization against radical Islam. And these countries like France, the U.S., need to stand with Israel because it's a, it's, it's a united front against this threat to Western civilization. It's now a year from the brutal Hamas attacks that happened last October 7th. What's your outlook for the year ahead? More fighting mm -hmm. and the possibility that Israel will directly attack Iran. They could attack their oil facilities, nuclear sites, and even some have speculated they'll go after the leadership itself. Now, if the leadership of Iran is overthrown, then we're going to see a whole different uh, um, Middle East as well as war. Mm, people watching uh, would want to know what specifically should we be praying for at this time? We know the scripture calls for us to yeah, pray for right. Israel. That's so right. what should we be praying for at this time? I think first of all, you know, Psalm 122 verse 6 says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I mm -hmm. think that's a great starting point. But beyond that, I think uh, there's a scripture in Isaiah chapter 40 mm -hmm. that says comfort, comfort ye my people. And I think the trauma uh, on Israelis and the uh, the people that we saw in our Julie story has really been so deep and so profound. Pray for the comfort of these families, the nation itself that has been so traumatized. I would also pray for victory. Uh, this is sort of like, uh, you know, pray for victory like you would pray in World War II against Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. Pray for victory against Hamas, totally, Hezbollah, and even Iran, and, uh, and that there would be a sense in, um, in the Israeli people, the Jewish people. One thing that has happened since October 7th is that they have drawn closer to God. Mm -hmm. You can see that in polls, you can see that in anecdotal things from the Gaza Strip in particular. They're not only, many are coming closer to God, not all, but the other thing is that they're also looking for their Messiah. There's a sense that we are living in biblical times, historic times, and, uh, and they're, they're praying 
for their Messiah to come back. Before we let you go real quick, of course, here in the States, we're following the election. Are the people of Israel watching and concerned about what happens here? Very concerned. And it's going to have a huge impact on Israel, the whole Middle East. And I would say there has been a recent poll. They believe Trump, as opposed to Kamala Harris, would be better for them in the long run. Uh, the U.S. in the last year has really been slow walking munitions, uh, trying to undermine the government. So I think overall Israelis are looking at the election as a pivotal one for them and the whole Middle East. All right, our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell, thank you so much as always for your insight and joining us. And of course, as always, we will continue to pray for you and our team as you head back to Israel as Thanks, well. Alfred. Thank you. Coming up here at home, how God is at work in the midst of the devastation of Hurricane Helene. We're gonna bring you that story from North Carolina. It's coming up when we come back. You're watching CBN News Watch. We're tracking a new hurricane threat to the eastern United States. Milton increased to a Category 2 hurricane early today as Florida geared up for what could be its biggest evacuation in seven years. As the storm heads towards major population centers, including Tampa and Orlando and in North Carolina, churches are playing a key role in giving comfort and relief to the victims of Hurricane Helene. CBN's Brody Carter is in Asheville. He brings us this report on how faith is helping the community endure. God is on the move here in North Carolina. Behind me is just one of several praise and worship events taking shape throughout the state. This is Hendersonville High School football field, and it's open to people of all faiths and denominations, but specifically, it's an opportunity to share that despite the storms in this life, we find our strength in God. In the midst of disaster, the way that we make it through is that we must hope in God and we must help each other. Thousands have lost power and have no access to food or clean water. Some have lost everything. We were 15 feet away from being crushed, leaving our two kids, and God knows what would have happened to them. Aaron and Larissa Smith were airlifted from their neighborhood after a boulder crashed into their home. All they and their two children have left is their dog and a suitcase. To be able to celebrate family and community and and God's faithfulness is, um, it's a unique blessing. Just north of Asheville, Brookstone Church in Weaverly held a service on the campus of Mars Hill University. The congregation offering comfort, hope, and strength to a community that's reeling from the devastation. People are asking a lot of questions they weren't asking nine days ago. And um, so it, yeah, it is, uh, man, it levels things, doesn't it? Like First Baptist Hendersonville, Brookstone is a hub for distributing food and other necessities to victims of the storm. They say people want to connect with others, find purpose in the tragedy, and experience the love of God. There is a hope that is felt. It is tangible here in these communities. And for those that don't believe in Christ, they are seeing the hope of Christ in 4K right in front of them as their neighbors go out and are pouring into one another. CBN's Operation Blessing International is on the ground, staged in Asheville's Home Depot parking lot, making and serving thousands of meals every day and giving away water and other supplies. OB teams have even flown into remote neighborhoods to deliver clean water and clean the shoes on their feet. A lot of the time we just use that hot meal, that water, that bucket with supplies as an excuse sometimes just to be there for the people that need it. But what is that? That's going to last maybe a day. But for us, it's more important to present Jesus. Reporting in Western North Carolina, Brody Carter, CBN News. And if you'd like to support Operation Blessing as it helps those hit by Helene, you can call 1-800-700-7000 or you can go to Operation Blessing's website. That is ob.org. Still ahead, the 30 by 30 initiative. It's a movement to recruit 30% more female police officers by the year 2030. We're going to have that story for you. It's coming up right after this. You're watching CBN News Watch. A nationwide movement is underway to increase the number of female police officers in America. More than 360 departments are committing to recruit 30% more women by the year 2030. 
Research shows more female officers could lead to fewer cases of excessive force and more community confidence in the police. CBN's Caitlin Burke is on this story. Policing has long been a male-dominated profession and likely will remain so. Still, a major shift is happening as departments recognize that having more female representation benefits both the police force and the community. Women make up less than 13 percent of police officers, a number that hasn't changed much in the past 20 years. A decade ago, while serving as the Newark police chief, Yvonne Roman noticed a disturbing trend. I started monitoring recruits as they cycled through police academies in the state of New Jersey. And I found that women were failing at rates between 65 and 80 percent due to varying aspects of the physical fitness test. This discovery led Roman to begin boot camp sessions for female recruits to better prepare them for the test. The result? Each woman she helped train graduated. Still, Roman felt the need to go further. In 2018, she and Maureen McGow of the National Institute of Justice took a closer look at women in law enforcement. Their research found an underrepresentation, resulting in the 30 by 30 initiative. It is a roadmap for improving both the representation and experiences of women officers. The goal is for women to represent 30 percent of police recruits by the year 2030, and departments nationwide are pledging support. The LAPD proudly joins over 40 law enforcement agencies across the nation who have signed the 30 by 30 pledge. We're very proud that the city of Fargo will be going in this direction. We hope your decision to take this pledge motivates other departments to follow in your footsteps. I think the initiative is just an incredible opportunity to really promote women. The 30 by 30 initiative provides research highlighting how adding more females will lead to better overall law enforcement. For example, statistics show police women less likely to use or be accused of using excessive force. They're also less likely to be named in a lawsuit or citizen complaint and can be more successful in defusing violent or aggressive behavior. Law enforcement has been looked at under that microscopic lens of how do we improve, how do we represent our communities, how do we make our communities feel safe. And I think that the reason why this is having the success that it is having is because people see the importance behind it and the fact that women are valued and that we do have a place. The Montgomery County Police Department has already reached about 20 percent female representation in both academy classes and on the force. Lieutenant Tanisha Jensen believes, however, that increasing those numbers will require a change in perception. Females may feel that they can't have that work-life balance, that they can't do the job of a police officer, that it will be um, too demanding and too competitive with trying to have a family, with trying to be a mom. Um, are, are the standards, is there equity between men and women as far as just different uh, positions, whether that's lateral positions in the department or uh, rising to the through the ranks uh, by promotion, and I think that we have to break those barriers. There's also a need for departments to offer benefits and a culture that women find attractive. One of the things that our department has done for several years is a job share program, and that's where an officer can split and divide their position and their hours with another officer. That would equal to working 20 hours a week as opposed to 40 hours a week. Other positive moves already being put into place include mentorship programs, affordable child care centers, and better parental leave. One of the things I would like departments to see that some do, but not a lot, is that they gear their training toward the sexes having a better understanding of each other. Veteran trainer Betsy Brantner-Smith tells CBN News achieving a change in culture would also lead to having the most effective police force possible. Police officers need to be able to de-escalate. Women do that naturally and are good at teaching it and we are good at modeling it. Why do we not teach men that women are good at this? Why do we not teach women that they are good at this? And we don't teach the women anything about uh, how men do things, how men communicate, how men fight, how men shoot. 
Brantner Smith also stresses that while greater female representation would benefit the force, the focus must ultimately be on hiring qualified police officers. When we're talking about a profession like law enforcement, where a police officer has the authority and the power and the skills to take a human life, we do not want to hire people based on their sex. A key goal of this initiative is for participating agencies to share promising practices, learn from one another, and ultimately develop policies that achieve a more balanced force and in turn, safer communities. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Montgomery County, Maryland. Coming up, thousands of college students praying, worshiping, and getting baptized at a changing event of their lives. We're going to have that story for you when we come back. Introducing a brand new way to start your morning, the CBN News Quick Start Podcast. Each weekday morning at 7 a.m., get quick highlights of the day's important news, then an in-depth analysis that goes beyond the headlines, insights that matter to people of faith. Discover how God is moving around the world and here at home. Find the CBN News Quick Start Podcast on iTunes or wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts, because truth matters. Students at Mississippi State University say their lives are forever changed. It comes after experiencing God's love at work during a massive worship event that happened last week. Unite Us reports nearly 6,000 students worship together. The night was marked by powerful prayer, repentance, and water baptisms, with the group writing on Instagram, quote, Jesus met us tonight in Humphrey Coliseum. Unite Us says it's a movement of college students united to lift the name of Jesus. Evangelist Tanya Pruitt reports more than 2,000 salvations and more than 800 baptisms have taken place through the Unite Us Campus events over the past year. Time now for your Monday motivation, and I'm pleased to share this word with you. Your mistakes can make a mess of things, but they're only one chapter in your story. They're not the book. Turn the page. Keep writing. Keep living. God can turn your mistakes into miracles. Expect better. Expect greater. Expect more. God honors his promise. The best is indeed yet to come. That will do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online, cbnnews.com. We thank you so much for watching. Look forward to seeing you right back here, same time tomorrow. Goodbye, God bless.